And now we're um, continuing the tradition, I think that was begun about two years ago, of having the residents uh, from our wonderful the KD Family Practice Department. They work on a project and they present to us. And it's been great. So if you ever on the K, you can look at the pictures of these lovely, lovely young, um, hopefully idealistic and compassionate family practice doctors. They will each introduce themselves. They're supposed to speak 10 minutes each. Uh, and then we will adjourn for lunch and lecture. Thank you. Actually, I'm not sure what order. Do you know what order you're coming up in? Yeah. All right. My name is Jared Morris. I, I represent the first and the best of the residency. We will have questions over here in the corner afterwards because we just have 10 minutes to discuss. Uh, I'll be talking on management of in-flight medical emergencies. Most of us have flown. This is a brief outline, and I'll cover some of these uh, shortly during my discussion, but most of us have flown, some of us maybe even flown while to uh, get here to this meeting. Uh, the increase in flight has also had an increase in elderly uh, patients that are flying that may not be as healthy as they wish to be and are visiting various part, portions of the countries and, and the nations. Um, and with this, the increase in incident has, has occurred in the um, there's approximately 13 to 33 incidents per, air, per flight day. One of the uh, major conditions that we come across is change in cabin pressure. All flights that are greater than 75,000 uh, pounds are pressurized to uh, a level of five to 8,000 feet. This affects uh, mildly healthy individuals, which can result in a relative hypoxia. But, eld but patients that are already sick and may have some underlying health conditions, this can affect uh, more drastically. One of the uh, major concerns is the change in cabin pressure following Boyle's law. Approximately, there's approximately 30% increase in air expansion at an elevation of five to 8,000 feet. This can affect ear your ears, causing ear pain, some tooth pain, as well as uh, some sinus pressure. Most of these occur during uh, the landing portion of the flight. However, during uh, the uh, takeoff and getting to altitude, patients with COPD may experience problems such as a pneumothorax. There's a, a nice case presented if you read the literature about a gentleman saving a patient with a, a catheter, a hanger, and a wine bottle. Um, other things that can occur are irritation of the GI tract, and other th considerations are medical devices, especially those devices that have been insufflated with air uh, they recommend insufflating these devices with water so the expansion is less. Other things to consider are patients that have feeding tubes. They recommend plugging these on descent, as well as patients that have had a, a, caster pla uh, a plaster cast placed in the last two weeks. They recommend bivalving this in order to de decrease pain. Air quality is also a consideration. There's a relative lack of humidity. Uh, also, patients that wish not to use the bathroom sometimes don't drink during the flight and can be dehydrated as well, and this can, can lead to some confusion. Transmission of airborne particles, as well as air rage. Alcohol at, uh, at altitude has worse effects than at sea level. There's also drug use and nicotine withdrawal during the uh, flights, especially if your flight's greater than eight, eight hours. There was a study between 1996 and 1997 performed by MedAir, which was contracted with five domestic uh, airlines in the United States, and they reported uh, approximately 1,100 incidents during this one year. Although three quarters of all incidents happened at the airport, these were in flight. The most common was vasovagal. Uh, the second most common was cardiac with a diversion rate of approximately 28% per incident. Neurological followed that with a diversion rate of about 20% per flight, followed by respiratory, GI complaints, and trauma. Um, again, when treating these, it's best to rule out the stuff that will kill you and then follow through uh, appropriately. When the study was performed, they noted that 60% of patients got better on their own meaning nobody had to intervene or little intervention was required. After this study was done, it was deemed not important to have a, a physician on each flight for the medical emergencies, but they did make changes accordingly. Um, when, 
when in flight there is an emergency medical kit that you can use, and they discovered during the study between 1996 and 1997 that if you did have to use the emergency medical kit, it was more likely that you had a severe case and the patient was more likely to need diversion. However, 31 percent of those patients that did use the emergency medical kit did improve. And a physician was more likely to use the emergency medical kit than anybody else. A role of a physician is always in question. It's a new environment. It's a sometimes hostile environment, and you may be the only one on board with medical expertise. But the flight crew has been trained to respond. As a physician, you should feel comfortable to help, especially with assisting the flight crew and coordinating care with the captain. The captain does have ultimate say, especially when they contact MedLink, whether diversion is needed or if they continue on with the last leg of flight. The cabin crew does receive some training, some basic life support, approximately 30 hours per year. The head captain, the head crew member is trained in the use of an AED, and you can use that as well. They are able to use a first aid kit with some rudimentary equipment, and there's also the in-flight medical kit if you are a medical provider you may use. There's also other passengers, and they may have medications that may not be in the emergency medical kit or some other items of use. And then there's ground-based medical advice through MedLink, which is contracted with MedAir out of Arizona. And using MedLink, there's been a 70 percent decrease in flight diversions. After contacting MedLink, the physician that is on board is no longer legally liable for that care of that patient. The basic first aid kit contains some basic items that can be used by the flight crew as well as you as the physician or medical provider. After the study, they did require that in-flight emergency medical kits require certain medications, and these are the required medications with each medical kit. However, airlines have changed according to the incidence and the use of these medications because they have tight, they have a small kit and they have to follow weight restrictions as well. There's also equipment available to you as a physician. One of the things that they started using was oxygen, and oxygen is available, but it's only low flow, so if there happens to be a patient with an asthmatic attack and needing a nebulizer, the flow is limited to two to four liters per minute, so not quite adequate, but may help. 1998 was when the Aviation Medical Assistance Act was enacted, pretty much the Good Samaritan Act, stating that if you are a qualified physician acting in good faith voluntarily, no willful misconduct and do not receive any compensation, you are not legally liable. This act also said that after the MedLink, after contacting MedLink, the physician that is on board is no longer legally liable, and this act of 1998 also required that, made it requisite that airlines report incidents. Before this, they weren't required. Compensation, however, on flight for flight vouchers and seat upgrades and wine and other things are not held under this Medical Assistance Act, so feel free to take those if you are given those. International law will play a role when we fly, and this can change through country as well as departure of the airline, destination of the airline, and origin of the airline, as well as the patient. Canada and Britain have similar laws to the United States. However, some of the European nations fly under civil law, which if you as a physician or medical provider are on that flight and an incident happens and you do not respond, you may be held legally liable, either by imprisonment or fine. Just some legal guidance when assisting a passenger, just like any other, obtain consent, use translation when necessary, recommend diversion. However, the captain will coordinate with MedLink, because MedLink will know the status of the airplane, how much fuel is left, if there's any facilities around. Also document, and if you're unfamiliar with an intervention, avoid that if necessary. 
AMA has put out some common uh, contraindications for flight. Um, basically, surgery within the past two to three weeks, um, recent heart attack, uh, recent pneumothorax within the past three weeks, women that are pregnant at 35 weeks or greater of gestation, and then uh, pediatrics in the first, year of, first week of life uh, recommend not flying. For con in conclusion, incidents happen. Uh, be prepared for assistance. Offer assistance. Don't feel that uh, you may be sued for doing something wrong. You won't. You won't be held liable. And as of right now, there aren't any any lawsuits pending for any in-flight incidents. And then document. And that's it. I am Brian Lofgren. I'm a third year resident at McKay D. And uh, that slight thumping you hear in the background, don't worry about that. That's just the microphone picking up my heart. You can just ignore that. Um, all kidding aside, we're going to be talking about a more serious topic today. We don't have enough time to address it in depth, but enough to get us thinking about some of these issues. We're going to be talking about physician assisted suicide. Uh, 15 years, where are we now referring to the Oregon law? Um, and then to use this, I just go next. There we go. Referring to the Hippocratic Oath, the tenant we're discussing is, I will neither give a deadly drug to anybody who asked for it, nor will I make a suggestion to this effect. So an outline of our presentation, we're going to talk about some brief definitions. We're going to talk about the Oregon law, what we know, what we don't know. We're going to talk about the moral implications, the legal implications, the ethical implications. And then also we're going to talk about the effect this has on physicians, a not well-studied area, but also a very important area. So um, physician-assisted suicide, the definition of that is essentially a physician prescribing a medication that the patient can then take on their own to um, end their life. Sometimes it's also referred to as physician-assisted death. Euthanasia is slightly different. This is a physician administering a medication to uh, end a patient's life. Um, terminal sedation, this is not um, uh, truly suicide and is actually legal in the United States. This is where a patient who is suffering, you sedate them into unconsciousness until they die. Um, what we're getting into here are some of the gray areas. What's the difference between sedating someone until they die versus giving them medication that sedates them until they die? So um, you can see there's some gray areas here. And then active shortening of the dying process is administering medications with the specific intent of shortening the dying process uh, either with or without other things such as alleviating pain. So the Oregon law was legalized in 1994 and it was uh, survived repeal in 1997. Some of the requirements for the patient is it has to be an adult who is capable to make the decision, suffering from a terminal illness defined as six months or less uh, to live, and they have to volunteer the wish to die. At that point, they need to do a um, request. Typically, it's an oral request accompanied by a written request, and then 15 days later, later a second oral request. Uh, these need to be signed by two witnesses. It cannot be the physician. Um, there are certain re restrictions on who those witnesses can be. The physician's role in this is they should discuss both the diagnosis and prognosis of the disease with the patient and certify their eligibility, um, the criteria we just discussed. They should discuss the risks and benefits. Although usually effective, um, there are cases where the patient has not died with the administration of these medications. And they should strongly recommend that the patient discuss the decision with their next of kin. Again, although not a requirement, a strong recommendation. Additionally, they are required to obtain a consult, a second opinion, confirming the above facts and then they are to refer for counseling if needed. Of note, this is not a uh, psychiatric evaluation. This is not determined if a patient is competent. This is more to refer just for counseling to discuss this option. And again, that is optional and not mandatory. And then the, uh, the uh, whole process needs to be reported to the state of Oregon. So what we know, since uh, inception of the law through 2009, there have been a total of 406 deaths. In 2009, there were 59 deaths, uh, 95 prescriptions written. About two-thirds of the patients getting a prescription are uh, using the medications to end their lives, and that's been pretty consistent across every year. In uh, 2009, 55 physicians wrote all 95 prescriptions. Uh, a couple interesting points down here at the bottom. None of the 59 who died in 2009 were referred for counseling. That is a, a departure from prior years where there was a percentage that had been referred for counseling. And also... Um, for unclear reasons, physicians present at the time of death has dropped from 22% down to 5%. What else do we know? Some demographics on the patients who are doing this. 53% uh, are male. 78% are in the age of 55 to 84 years of age. 98% are white. 
Uh, 48% have a college education or higher, a college degree. And if you add in high school education or higher, it goes up to about 80%. And about 80% had a terminal diagnosis of cancer. 98% died at home. About 92% were enrolled in a hospice program at the time of their decision. And about 99% had insurance, of which 85% was private. So this is a really interesting slide. Patients' reasons for choosing, choosing to pursue uh, physician-assisted suicide. Losing autonomy was the number one. Um, number two, inability to engage in enjoyable activities and loss of dignity. Everything else was around 50% or lower, including things like pain control, which was down around 20%, and cost of treatment was about 12%. But overwhelmingly, these three top responses were the reasons people were citing for pursuing physician-assisted suicide. Um, other results, more patients are discussing uh, this option with their physician. One of 50 dying patients discuss it with their physician. More patients are discussing it with their families. One in six patients who are dying discuss this option with their family. There's been an increase in hospice referrals in Oregon. There's been an increased amount of people dying at their home as opposed to in critical care units and hospitals and uh, nursing facilities. And there's also been increased physician training and awareness in, in palliative and hospice care. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the moral implications. The first question we need to ask ourselves is about our moral intuition. Is our vernacular correct? Should we be saying physician-assisted suicide? Should we say something like physician-assisted death? Should we say something like physician-assisted uh, alleviation of suffering, which sounds much more uh, in line with our ideals? So just by saying physician-assisted suicide, are we automatically setting ourselves up to um, deny this option? Next up is religious prohibitions. Uh, most major religions do have, um, although not formal, uh, statements about this. They do teach uh, against this. The Catholic Church has some statements about it. Most Protestant churches uh, unite in opposition of any initiative to put this on ballots, or uh, when they tried to repeal this in 1997, there was a strong Protestant group with that. Uh, Eastern religions as well are uh, similar in that regard. And then there's our medical tradition. At the beginning of the slideshow, we talked about the Hippocratic Oath, which has been with us for centuries. We also talk about the uh, current AMA and ACP stance, which is essentially that if there is unrelieved suffering by a patient, we need to intervene more, we need to do more, uh, with the, the implication that we can fix suffering even at the end of life. There are legal implications. The Oregon law specifically protects uh, physicians from criminal and civil suits as long as they proceed correctly with the steps. In uh, 2001, there was a Supreme Court case. It was uh, triggered by uh, uh, the Attorney General at the time. Uh, his argument was essentially these medicines are controlled under the DEA, and any physician using them to end lives will have their DEA license revoked. Uh, the Supreme Court essentially said that uh, in Oregon, it's recognized as the standard of care, and since it's the standard of care, you cannot use the DEA or your controlled substance laws to regulate its uh, control. They did, however, reserve the right for the federal government to legislate on the issue, although Congress has not shown any interest in doing that to date. So ethical implications. Are we relieving suffering or are we prolonging life? Typically, these run together, but do they always run together? And in this case, are they running together? Should we be focusing more on relieving suffering of our patients? Should we be more focused on prolonging their life? There are a lot of gray areas here. The Ethicus um, study was performed in Europe among critical care physicians. Uh, and one important thing they talked about was, <coughs> excuse me, was the uh, patients who had decided to make, or families who made the decision to withdraw life support, up to 18% of the physicians were administering um, treatments or interventions to actively shorten life. And the question came up was, were they doing that to shorten the life and shorten the suffering, or were they administering these medications to relieve suffering, and if it shortened life, that was okay. And what they kind of came up with is there's a bright line in physicians, and that's very hard to distinguish what their reasoning is, partly because most physicians won't talk about it, and partly because physicians generally don't admit to doing things that are of questionable legality. And then we're talking about physician impact. These last four or five slides are just talking about what physicians have actually said. These are physicians who have uh, participated in the process. Most of them are taken from Dutch physicians, but some of them are also taken from physicians from Oregon. And we'll just read these quotes. The first one, to kill someone is, far, is something far-reaching, and that is something that nags at your conscience. I wonder what it would be like not to have these cases in my practice. Perhaps I would be a more cheerful person. You never get accustomed to killing someone. We're not trained to kill. With euthanasia, your nightmare comes true. When a patient said to me, doctor, this is unbearable for me. Please help me die. The first reaction as a doctor is, oh, my God, a request again, and I will find whatever I can to prevent it. 
I wonder if I have the emotional peace to continue to participate. I find I can't turn off my feelings at work as easily because it goes against what I wanted to do as a physician. It was an excruciating thing to do. It made me rethink life's priorities. This was really hard on me being there when he took the pills. I had to accept that this was really going to happen. The thought of Helen dying so soon was almost too much to bear. On the other hand, I found even worse the thought of disappointing this family. I would look out the window that day and try to imagine what it would feel like to take leave of the earth that day, and it was a pretty nice day. And the sadness that thought induced in me, and I couldn't find it in my patient. I wouldn't ask my own doctor to help in this way because it's a lot to ask. I hate it. And then here are some references. Again, we'll be available for questions afterwards. I'm Kurt Flinders. Uh, I sign on in the Intermountain North Ogden Clinic. And uh, I'm going to be talking about underreporting of concussion symptoms in high school football. Um, first of all, just brief uh, the objectives here, just to provide a brief overview of the, the current management of concussions, what's changed, and then present the research project I did this year. So I became interested because I, I love sports, but also because there's just been a ton of, uh, of focus placed on this over the last year, especially with the NFL and some prominent players. In the literature, there's been a lot of studies uh, has, has been done. So a little background on concussions. Um, in 2001 was the first time that uh, a group got together and decided what a concussion is and, and how to manage it. And that's in 2001. We've had two other updates since that point, with the most recent in November 2008 in Zurich. Um, and just, I'll hit a couple highlights here. Uh, first of all, concussion, most concussions resolve in seven to ten days, and um, although adolescents and children should have uh, more consideration of allowing more time. Uh, but also there's a graduated return to play. They took off uh, how, how you grade concussions, no longer classifying or grading concussions, mainly just uh, doing a stepwise exertional testing uh, to decide when it's uh, appropriate for them to return to play. And that, that requires that the, that the person says, yes, I have symptoms still when I do exertional activity. Uh, but there's also some neuropsychiatric testing that you can do uh, as well that's coming more prevalent. We'll talk about that. And um, each step should take at least 24 hours and no return to play on the same day. So my particular study that I'll focus on the rest of the time here, um, just some more on concussion, though. There's two vital moments in uh, the diagnosis of a concussion. First of all is the initial screening and then a proper diagnosis. And then subsequently when it's appropriate for the, the player to, to go back and play either football or what have you. And so to get that proper diagnosis, the initial screen is usually done on the sidelines with a, a sideline and a quick assessment tool. SCAT2 is probably the most prominent. It came out of the Zurich study, although there are others available. And then return to play is more and more being aided by this uh, graded stepwise that we talked about, but more and more neurocognitive testing. Impact is one of those. There are others. I don't have any financial <coughs> um, interest. And then multidisciplinary teams are more and more becoming involved, especially for elite athletes. Uh, where different uh, specialties are being involved to make this decision. Um, you know, as I looked at the, the, the Zurich guidelines and I looked at the things that we have, the diagnosis concussion, decide when to return to play, I, I thought in my mind there seems to be a, a huge flaw in this strategy because it, it presupposes that the player themselves is reporting these symptoms to begin with. And if the underreporting of concussion symptoms is as prevalent, I think, as is widely accepted, then I thought this uh, strategy was flawed. So my purpose was to say, uh, to examine the player to trainer reporting of uh, concussion symptoms in high school football. I come up with a, uh, a list here of symptoms that I derived from the SCAT2 forum from Zurich. And, uh, and you can see here the symptoms that I asked the, uh, the players following football games. First of all, 144 players uh, were chosen um, from seven local high schools. And uh, after, within 24 hours of their most recent game, this was handed out to them. And you can see loss of consciousness, memory loss, headache, neck pain, pressure in head, etc. And again, this derived from SCAT 2. <clears throat> and, and the important thing is that, again, there's only one form per player. These weren't uh, multiple forms. Uh, complete confidentiality was assured, therefore, that they didn't have repercussions of playing time or intimidation or anything. 
And, and the other thing was that you had to have played in the game, and you couldn't have stood on the sideline all game. This is the results uh, that came back from those studies showing that, uh, you, you can see the most prominent symptoms were headache, pressure, and head and neck pain. But also of note, you can see here that 8% had balance, balance problems, 7% difficulty concentrating, 2% uh, confusion, nearly 3% loss of consciousness. This isn't a percentage, but rather the actual number of symptoms that were reported. And you can see that the most prominent ones, again, headache, pressure, and head and neck pain were uh, re relatively the least common to be reported to trainers. But again, um, you know, balance problems, 12, yet only two were reported to trainers. 6% difficulty remembering, but only one was reported to trainer. Four had loss of consciousness, but no one, uh, it must have been temporary enough that they uh, would have had to report it. This graph shows the total number of symptoms experienced, 181 over the 144 players, with only 13 of them being reported, which is a 9% reporting rate. Um, this graph here shows the number of symptoms that uh, players experience. For example, 13% of players uh, had at least three uh, had three symptoms. 4% had two symptoms. If you add these up, that at least it shows that at least three that 24% of players had at least three symptoms. And even more alarming was that uh, about 10% uh, of players had at least five symptoms. So because you know, I, I got thinking to myself, well, yeah, I put on a he helmet and I got a headache from just putting it on. Um, it seems kind of silly to ask someone if they have a headache when they're running around with a helmet on. And so I thought, well, maybe there's so many symptoms because we're asking such simple symptoms like headache, pressure, and head uh, with football. And so I thought I would focus on the more what I call significant cognitive symptoms that look more at memory loss, loss of consciousness, blurred vision, balance problems, and took out the headache, neck pain, and so forth. And what I found is that still nearly one in six had experienced at least one of, the, one of these symptoms. And so this shows that uh, 45 out of 144 had at least one of these symptoms, and, and only six of those uh, were reported to trainers. So the ne significant neurocognitive symptoms we just talked about, 7% reported versus, uh, or 13% reported versus the uh, total symptoms of 7 to 9% reported. This was a different study I did, but uh, kind of tie it here in at the end in that I followed some of these schools out farther and built in some controls here and found that the more I asked these players for, to tell me what their symptoms were, even in the setting of confidentiality, the more they kind of blew me off, so to speak, so that week to week I could see a decline in them telling me what symptoms they were actually having. So in conclusion, um, high school football players possibly experience concussion symptoms at alarming numbers, and they significantly underreport these symptoms to trainers. Um, some symptoms are more likely to be reported than others. And, you know, this study was not set up to directly measure the concussion rate, but I thought it would be interesting to look. Let's say that if three or more symptoms correlated with concussion, uh, one in four possibly could have had a concussion. If we say, okay, we'll take five, they had to have at least five symptoms, that steer nearly one in ten had a concussion. And then if we looked at only the significant cognitive symptoms, the balance problems, loss of consciousness, et cetera, still one in six may have had a concussion. Forty-eight percent of players had at least one symptom, meaning that if strict rules were followed and all symptoms reported, half the team would be sitting on the sideline for the rest of the game. Um, which leads kind of the other thing that, that led me to do this study is, if we are only seeing the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, as far as reporting symptoms, are we, are we uh, focusing on and magnifying an otherwise low complication right associated with concussions? <clears throat> and then all symptoms, including significant cognitive symptoms, were underreported. So the bottom line here, I think all relevant for us is uh, you can't trust kids to tell you what they're feeling, especially when they can't see past Friday night or Saturday night and they don't see the long-term sequelae. And second of all, we don't really, I think, understand what it means, what all this means as far as long-term sequelae. And so we ought to be kind of informed on what's going on. And I think the, the move of the future is more toward more objective testing for this very reason. To, to kind of set up all our testing based on a subjective reporting, I think, is flawed. And so I think we're going to see a, a shift toward objective testing. And, and so I think the days of just signing Johnny's you know, for him to go back and play is over. Uh, there's standard of care that's being established, and uh, here's the uh, reference of the latest guidelines. All right.
Schultz. I'm Matt Spencer. I'm actually going to be doing a case presentation for my talk, and I'll just jump right into this. So every year around the time of this um, convention, um, Ogden has the annual Ogden Marathon. It's actually coming up in two days from now, so everybody get ready if you're not trained yet. Um, as, as residents, we have the opportunity to cover the medical tent for the marathon every year. We work alongside nurses, athletic trainers, and, of course, attending physicians in, in providing medical coverage for the athletes in the marathon. Um, here's just a couple of pictures. I want you to focus on the picture on the bottom shows the general layout of the tent. We had pretty, essentially two rows of cots to take care of athletes. The majority of what we saw was dehydration, nausea, vomiting, muscle cramps, um, sprains, bruises, things like that. Um, pay special attention to this pool that's uh, being filled with water in the back corner of this picture. We'll talk about that in one second. So this specific case talks about a 35-year-old gentleman who had just completed the Ogden Marathon. Um, the brief history that we had at the time from his wife is that he had no past medical history, that he had actually um, done quite a bit of training for this race, and she said that he had done fine up until the the very end of the race. Um, some eyewitnesses that we, that we talked to after the fact said that they'd actually seen him struggling up to a couple miles before the end of the race. So we had some kind of conflicting um, reports about, of exactly what happened. So he, he collapsed at the finish line and he was immediately brought to our tent by some volunteers. He was evaluated by myself and another resident. Initially he was unresponsive, he was pale, he was clammy. Uh, we quickly took a tympanic temperature, it was 41 degrees Celsius, and we confirmed this with a rectal temperature of uh, 41 degrees, 41.7 degrees Celsius, which is 107 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, we quickly uh, stripped his clothes and we transferred him to the, the pool, of the, the pitcher of the pool that I showed you earlier that was full of water. We quickly filled it with ice. We packed ice around all the major arteries of, of his neck in an attempt to rapidly bring his temperature down. Um, so I'm glad that Justin White is here. Justin, um, at the time when he was in the residency with us, had the opportunity of, of frequently checking his um, core body temperature rectally. Uh, we did this, I don't know, every five or 10 minutes. Um, we, we monitored it, he, we got his temperature down to 39 degrees Celsius. Um, we also started some IVs, some, uh, some, some fluids he was receiving. Uh, when his temperature did get down to 39 degrees Celsius, we transferred him uh, to the emergency room after providing supplemental oxygen. In the ER, from the ER notes, he had normal labs, he had a normal blood gas, and according to the report, he was actually slightly hypothermic when he arrived to the emergency room. Um, so we, we did a very good job of, of getting his temperature down. Um, according to the ER note, he was, he was given some fluid boluses, treated for nausea. Uh, the note um, indicated that his mental status had, had improved substantially and he was discharged to home. Um, one of the physicians who we were working with um, in the tent was actually just coincidentally the doctor of the wife of, of this patient. So he did some, some kind of researching, found, found how to get a hold of him, and he called him a couple days later just to, to get some follow-up. Um, according to the so this is two days after the race. According to the wife, he was still uh, confused. He had some nausea, some muscle aches, some weakness. He had actually, somebody had said that he had been sent home or, or came home from work because he was so confused he, he just couldn't concentrate and couldn't keep up with work. So, so this was somewhat of a concern. Um, this doctor called again uh, a, day, a day after that, so this is Tuesday, the Tuesday after the race. So this is three days after the race. Um, he still had the same complaints, and so the, phys the physician at that time ordered some labs. Among those labs was a, a CPK, which um, showed a level of uh, 4,500. Um, and just as a level of reference, uh, it sounds like most of the time if you have a level of about 1,000, you're admitted to the hospital to get IV fluids. Um, luckily, as part of those labs, he had normal renal function. He hadn't suffered any consequences or shown any manifestations of rhabdomyolysis other than the elevation of the CPK. So just definition-wise, just talking about heat stroke, it is a form of hypothermia. It's a true medical emergency manifest by physiological and neurological complaints. Um, acutely, one of the very first manifestations usually is collapse of the, of, of the patient, which is what we, what we had in this case. You can also have acutely symptoms that mimic a a heart attack. Um, Subacutely, you can have nausea, vomiting, dizziness, fatigue, some of the symptoms that, that I'm having right now. Um, <laughs> so um, the, the things that I want to drive home are, are a couple of things. One, death from heat stroke is preventable. Um, if, if it's recognized early by, by a physician or, or a medical provider, 
And the thing that keeps us from preventing death in these cases is our inability to recognize these cases. The definition of heat stroke is actually very simple. The first thing you need is a change in mental status and a raise in core body temperature greater than 41 degrees Celsius. There is one talk talking about the randomness and the ability to predict heat stroke. Obviously, there's no perfect way of, before any kind of event of saying you're going to get heat stroke, you're going to get heat stroke, but there are certain risk factors. This particular paper looked at six cases of fatal heat stroke and identified common factors in all those people. The most common factors were low physical fitness, sleep deprivation, and not being properly acclimatized. Also, physical effort unmatched to physical activity and the absence of proper medical triage was present in 100% of cases of fatal heat stroke. And in cases of non-fatal heat stroke, additional risk factors were training during the hottest hours of the day. So in our particular patient, in talking to him afterwards, we just spoke to him a few months ago, he had been, it sounds like he had done some proper training. He was involved in a training circuit where you run a 5K and then a 10K, then a half marathon, and then a marathon, and I think there's some other races in between those. So he had been participating in this and doing these kind of things to get ready. The one thing that is interesting in talking to him is that most of his training, it seems like, took place at very early hours of the morning when the sun hadn't come out yet or was just coming out and it wasn't very hot. So he was out running the Ogden Marathon, which at the finish line is 11 or 12, depending on how fast you're running with temperatures probably that day of mid to high 70s to low 80s. And from talking to him, he wasn't used to practicing in those kind of conditions as far as heat. So this is just one quick slide. I won't harp on this too much because I think that we've all heard this at some point, the proper way to take a core body temperature. So tympanic, oral, axillary, you can use, obviously, if you need something quick, if it's the only way you have of assessing somebody's temperature, but obviously the only way of getting a true accurate core body temperature is doing a rectal temperature. It is invasive. It is time intensive. There is one study, and I brought this. This is the same thermometer, not the exact same one, but the same brand we used at the marathon. So the one report says you have to be 10 to 15 centimeters beyond the anal sphincter to get an accurate measuring. This is almost 13 centimeters. So be careful. I mean, for you and the patient, you want to be careful. So there's this concept of the lucid interval. I mentioned that one of the keys to diagnosing heat stroke is altered mental status. And so how do you know if somebody is exhibiting altered mental status or if they're just being belligerent? And the bottom line is it's very hard to tell. There's one case of a case report by a physician who was running a tent similar to ours who had an athlete come in after a race. He was hyperthermic. They wanted to get a rectal temperature. And the athlete essentially said, well, there's no, we used a lot of profanities, way you're going to take my temperature that way. And within a few minutes, the patient was unconscious and almost dead. So if you're suspecting this case and you have a high suspicion, I think the key is you just have to sit on top of these people, watch them very closely, and in a lot of cases just be insistent on getting a temperature to try to diagnose this. And so there's this concept of rapid cooling, a concept that we employed. It was first kind of seen in the military, and then there's been one or two authors that have proposed this method. And essentially they want you to, as quick as possible, to put the patient in an ice water bath to get the core body temperature down, which is what we did. And in one specific paper, survival is guaranteed in 100% of cases if rapid cooling is initiated within 10 minutes. So that's pretty good outcomes. And I think something that's important in our case is, and something that's important in this paper, is that you're supposed to cool the patient first and then transport them to the medical facility. And I don't know if you guys have been around and seen our, well, you saw a picture of the tent. It's just kind of a tent, some grass, and some cots. It's not a true medical facility. But we did have a tub full of water and full of ice water. And for about 30 to 45 minutes we worked on getting this patient's core body temperature down. The whole time the paramedics were kind of hovering over our shoulders waiting to get this patient from our makeshift medical tent to the hospital. And the whole point is that 
to best serve this patient, we need to get his core body temperature down and then transport him to the hospital. And I think that that was, um, that was to the patient's benefit. So, so who does this affect? It affects essentially anybody. Anybody who does any sideline medicine, sports medicine, uh, races, football games, you know, Rick taking, you know, coaches a soccer team, any one of his soccer players could, could, you know, start talking funny and collapse, and then Rick would try to take out their kidney stones. But, um, but it applies to anybody, acutely, subacutely. You could see this in an instacare, urgent care, emergency. Um, if you work with scouts, you can imagine this little overweight scout who doesn't get out much, who goes on an all-day hike, could, could exhibit something like this. So, so as physicians, this could happen in any setting to anybody. Um, it doesn't happen very often, but I think the key is to, to be alert, to, to be um, tuned into this, and to... Um, provide the proper medical coverage when or as possible. Thank you. I almost feel like I need a step. I'm Dr. Michelle Oates. Um, I recently signed with a locum tenens company to go to New Zealand, where I will actually be able to incorporate wilderness medicine in part of my practice. I'm really excited about that. And I'm going to touch a little bit on a case that happened to me uh, personally about a year ago in June of 2009 that helped me understand the importance of being prepared in areas where we don't have that pristine um, atmosphere of a hospital, where we have everything available to us. And I hope this makes you think, especially with the previous case and in the um, next presentation as well, is we need to be prepared for these things that are going to thrust us outside of our comfort zones and help us um, get the training that we need to handle these things as people are going to expect us to. So like I said, in June 2009, eight of us went on a preparation hike to summit Mount Rainier. This one was much shorter and much easier. A four-mile hike, overnight camping on the snow, and we all had variable hiking experience from zero to a professional mountain guide. Um, this isn't very unusual. About 97% of uh, Americans actually hike and do outdoor recreation. Backpacking and hiking are the fastest growing uh, activities in the outdoors. So we camped overnight on that nice little snow field, no problems. Woke up the next day to this beautiful weather. Uh, the clouds were going, and as we got about halfway up, we got a little bit of later start, uh, we noticed that uh, the weather was changing rapidly. So within about 30 minutes, we went from a nice sunny day to this. Um, so we had a new situation. We had lightning, snow, hail, rain, and about two inches of mud. And this little bit of rain, there was a thunder clap right there. Uh, so we decided to get off the mountain quickly. Um, as you know, lightning on top of mountain peaks isn't a good idea for hikers. So we stopped to eat for lunch, uh, which this turned out to be um, kind of a pivoting point in our hike. Uh, we had two groups. Uh, one is a faster group, the more experienced group, and the other was kind of helping the uh, novices along. We stopped in this coolie, it's kind of a ravine where all the debris falls down, lots of water runoff, and apparently lots of snow. Um, so underneath all this snow is a lot of boulders, trees, who knows what's under there, probably dead bodies too. Anyway, after this experience. So we were sitting there, some people were sitting in the middle of the coolie, facing down, they actually took their packs off. Um, I luckily was on the side facing up, kept my pack on because I'm too lazy to take it off and put it back on. Um, so we were all just kind of camping out there for just a little bit. And all of a sudden, out of that top area, that very apex, I saw a three-foot boulder come barreling down, kind of like in a Plinko game. You know how that little thing uh, goes back and forth from the prices, right? Imagine that with a three-foot boulder. No sound. You, don't, you can't predict where it's going. So the atmosphere was very ominous with that. And it ended up hitting one of my friends who was, couldn't get out of the way because he had his pack off and he was sitting facing the other way. Suddenly, all of a sudden, I realized, oh, crap, this is me. I, I'm up, because everyone knew I was a doctor, and they're kidding me about it the whole time. Um, so was I comfortable? Was I ready for the expectations of everyone else? Was I ready for my own expectations as well? This is my friend. Um, so I did a, research, a small little research study, about 37 physicians in the area, most ER physicians and family physicians. A couple of specialists were involved as well. And I asked them kind of what they would expect in situations like this. Um, everyone suggested that leading efforts were definitely part of it. Um, or advanced aid as part of it, because that's what we're trained in. All of it, and then half of them suggested a mixed thing of leading efforts, directing medical stabilization, administering first aid, and advanced aid. So is advanced aid really needed on a four-mile hike? 
well, um, wilderness medicine uh, research has showed of the life-threatening events, 32% actually needed advanced aid, and of the non-life-threatening events, 15% needed it. Um, and that included anything from pneumatic shock trousers, needle chest thoracostomy, you know, the fun stuff, or urinary catheterization. I'm not sure why that's life-saving, but they think it is. Um, so, you know, I was thrust from my comfort zone. I did not expect that at all. Um, I had just finished a rotation. I was on vacation. Um, 52% of the physicians said, yes, I'm comfortable, whereas 48% not, so it's about half and half. Interesting thing is two who had no formal training said, yes, I'm very comfortable. And then a few, two or three, also said, who had training, I was like, no, I'm not really comfortable with the situation. So it comes to the question, is, is training important? 50% of um, all of the physicians said, or had training. So, you know, it was 50-50 of who actually went through with this. Whereas 88% said, yes, it is important. Yeah, you should have training. And of the 12% who said no, there was interesting um, responses like, no, I don't participate in these extreme activities, or um, you should only do it if you're interested in it. Uh, you're going to be involved in scouting activities. You're going to be involved in treks. You are the team physician. You're going to come across car accidents. This is going to come up um, is what I'm what we have been trying to show you through these, a lot of these presentations. Another thing is, was this a freak accident or is this something that we can expect? Because uh, if this is a freak, a or if this is common, maybe I shouldn't do this anymore. Anyway, um, so there was a study done in the Utah National Parks that showed the reasons why uh, these things happen. Number one was insufficient information, error in judgment, uh, clothing, equipment, experience, fatigue also plays a part, falls or darkness. And this video clip will tell you what happened to us? If it's really close, it'll be instantaneous. The yeah, I know. And, the flash. and that's us retreating right there. Obviously. We're retreating. We got too late to start. That we're carrying metal sticks on high peaks. Yeah. <laughs> obviously, you shouldn't be carrying pickets on a mountain in a thunderstorm. Um, so we got a late start. We were ill prepared. We didn't have the weather forecast. We thought it was going to be a nice day. Weather changes on mountains, however. Uh, as far as uh, the injuries that happened, I'll go into what happened to him. But uh, the most common I have always in multiple studies been lower extremity injuries first, then hand, wrist, then head or neck. That changes a little bit with skiing and snowboarding, however. Uh, men tend to be hurt by sharp objects, substitute or substance abuse, and climbing type activities, where women are mostly injured during horseback riding activities. Uh, the top five causes of mortality, I thought this was very interesting. Cardiac uh, events, drowning, falls, then motor vehicle accidents took me by surprise uh, and plane crashes, and this is all within our national park system. Um, and of the search and rescue calls, hiking and uh, water sports are the number one uh, events involved in rescues. Uh, and going down motor vehicle accidents as well, and then actually suicides. People are very successful in suicides, and those are usually body recoveries and not um, rescue situations, which is unfortunate. So, you know, that's all of the national parks. Is our wilderness here in Utah different? That's part of the fascination that brought me here is these wonderful national parks. We are a little bit different. We have a little more canyoneering and climbing. What does that mean? We're going to have a little bit more of severe injuries when we actually uh, encounter them if we're out in these national parks. Um, we also have a lot of avalanches as manifest by this year's snowfall. Uh, there were several search and rescue efforts done by the Weber County uh, search and rescue for avalanches. Most people do die. 75% uh, are from asphyxiation. 13% uh, of those also have major trauma. 24 were deemed by trauma alone. Uh, and your death rate kind of changes by activity. Snowmobilers, only 9% tend to die in avalanches, whereas ice climbers, it's a little bit more extreme, and 42% if you're involved in an avalanche actually um, pass away. So of our physicians, how many were actually involved in wilderness medicine? You know, so yeah, we should be trained. What's the actual occurrence rate? 88% um, have used wilderness medicine at some point in their life. 6% 6 re 6 resort report using it weekly. About half had over encounters over the past year, and um, half again up to five times over the lifetime, and 3% have had more than 10 encounters over their lifetime. Um, when laypersons were studied to see if training actually makes a difference in, in the outcomes at all, it did make a difference in bleeding emergencies, but not really the rate of helping. What really made a difference was training and helping behaviors, because the main inhibitor is a crowd of people. 
psychologists have studied this, and if there's one person in the room, 75% of trained persons will help, where if there's more than two people in the room, that number drops to 10%. So moral of the story is don't have a heart attack in this room right now. Um, training. It provides you the confidence to do what you know of what to do. It gives you those tools so that your training becomes instinctual. You don't have to stop and think through algorithms. You don't have to stop and think through patterns. You just know what to do because you've been trained and you'll use that because you'll forget everything else. It also gives you a toolbox of things to draw from when you need to. So assessment of my friend, full thickness, three inch skin laceration, popliteal fossa. That was our little medical clinic right there. It was not fun. Um, everyone had to try and stop from falling down too. Um, painfully un unable to bear weight. Uh, there was no other apparent injury that needed to be addressed at that time, but the dangers he was facing was bleeding, hypothermia, and dehydration. But in wilderness medicine, you have to remember, you have more than one patient. Everyone is a patient. There's the safety of the area. Who knows what triggered that boulder? We were all in danger of being hit again. All of us were soaked. That's why we left our lunch, because everyone was shivering. Everyone has dehydration, limited water supply, and as you can tell, my friend there, he's yawning. We're all pretty tired. The other guy's kind of collapsed. He's being dramatic. Anyway, so we were sitting there. Should we call search and rescue? You know, are we the adequate people to help out? What skills do we have? We had a satellite phone and like three or four GPS units. Uh, common attitude is we have this technology. You know, here we are in the wilderness. We can get out of this because we have technology. Um, without search and rescue, one in five would actually be fatalities. So it is important to use search and rescue. However, these technologies, um, they get better and better, but it's been called a Yuppie 911 device. Uh, the concept of itself is absolutely great, but a lot of people are taking these things out, not being prepared because they, they're relying on this technology that doesn't always work, and they're taking risks that they otherwise wouldn't have. And the main problem is great GPS location. Search and rescue knows where you are. They are not always able to get to you, so you often have to move to them. So the recommendations are, when you're in these situations, be realistic about your abilities to manage illnesses and injuries. Certain norms are not possible, or they can be hazardous, such as continuing CPR until you reach a hospital. If there's a boulder coming down at you, you're probably not going to be able to do that. And acknowledge that fatalities will occur, and most of the times it's somebody you know, somebody you're in charge of, a child, a friend, a relative. So our plan with him quickest and easiest way to get out was to take him out ourselves. We tied a bandage around his laceration, used duct tape. It's marvelous. We used a sleeping pad as a splint for his leg. We tried to have him hobble out. It didn't work. We put him on a little makeshift gurney and gave the patient all of our extra clothing. We had to split up our other heavy packs. We were at least 30 to 50 pounds each. And we took him off the mountain slowly. And under that is about two feet of debris. So for me, that came up to my waist. For everyone else, it was, you know, just mid-thigh. <laughs> I know, it's horrible. So it took four hours to go one mile. Um, that's 28 man hours to go this one mile to transport the patient and all of the gear. He ended up having a fibula fracture, um, a complete ACL tear, and also a narrow escape from compartment syndrome. So the lessons that I took out from here and that I hope that you guys uh, stop and ponder and think about are there are times that we're going to be thrust from our, our comfort zones. We need to be prepared, and practice helps make you feel comfortable. The training gives you the tools, you need, tools that you need so that when you are in that situation, you don't need to think through it. You already have those available to you. Don't summit in a thunder snowstorm. It's not a good idea. And don't sit down in the middle of a ravine or coulee. Um, and then uh, Dr. Dave Hall will actually start giving a presentation about Haiti and some of the applications that uh, they had to use uh, of wilderness medicine and that kind of situation. I'm David Hall. Um, after all those great presentations, I guess I'm the also ran. Um, I'm going to be going to practice rural family medicine in a small town in eastern Oregon called John Day. And um, I returned on Monday from a 10-day trip to Haiti, uh, a medical mission there, with, uh, along with uh, Dr. Rocky Seal. And uh, so I'm going to be sharing a little bit from my experience there in the current uh, condition of the uh, medical relief effort there in, uh, in Haiti and specifically in a town called Leogan. 
Uh, Leogan is a city of about 180,000 residents, about 18 miles west of the, of the capital, Port-au-Prince. Um, it is the location of uh, Haiti's only nursing school. And just to give you an idea of the medical system in, in Leogan, there was a 120-bed general hospital with uh, ER, OR, uh, and other services, but that was closed in, in 2008 after falling into disrepair um, and and whatnot. Uh, January 12, 2010, a 7.0 magnitude earthquake struck uh, Haiti. Uh, it killed an estimated 250,000 people, left another 300,000 wounded, and leaving 1 million people uh, without a home. In contrast, the earthquake that struck uh, San Francisco in 1989, it was also a magnitude 7.0 earthquake, um, but only 63 people were killed. The epicenter of the earthquake was near Leogan. Up to 30,000 people were killed in Leogan alone. Um, much of it is a result of, um, or most of it a result of uh, buildings collapsing. 80 to 90 percent of buildings in Leogan were either damaged or leveled. This is uh, a few, these are a few photos that I, uh, myself and Rocky Seal uh, took of the, of the devastation there. Just to give you an idea. And this used to be a three-story building. Um, as you can imagine, many people there were affected by this earthquake. Many had, uh, almost everybody knew somebody, a friend or family member who died in the earthquake. This young man here, his name is Nelson, and he was one of our interpreters uh, in Leogan. He uh, told his experience of the earthquake. Um, the day of the earthquake, he, and, uh, he was at a shopping center, a three-story shopping center, buying a cell phone. And um, the next day that that um, he, he saw that building and it was completely leveled, um, killing five of the air, all five of the employees of that shopping center and, and countless uh, uh, customers. Uh, he and his friends were walking down the street there in Leogan and found, um, and found right right there, uh, the legs of a woman sticking out underneath that building, and they they uh, frantically uh, dug her out, but unfortunately she was already dead. Um, the, the hospital that was there that was already non-functional was partially demolished and, and so couldn't be used. The nursing school consequently became an impromptu hospital. And because uh, outside aid did not come for as many as five days, the n nursing students and, and, the, and the medical personnel that were already there in Leogan became the doctors. This young man right here, his name is uh, Regan Lewis. He was a nursing student at the nursing school at the time. And the story is told of, um, of uh, that he had a, a very young girl come to, or that presented to him with a severely mangled hand that was beyond repair and was at risk of infection. And using only lidocaine for uh, local anesthesia, he amputated her hand as a nursing student. Um, when help did arrive, many uh, or several mobile hospitals were erected, and one um, by this uh, organization, Worldwide Village, um, of which um, doctors uh, Rosemary Lesser and David Lesser and, and Dr. Rocky Seal and I are, are, have been associated. Um, and then multiple temporary clinics were also organized, um, one by an organization called International Aid Serving Kids, which uh, Dr. Uh, Mark Johnson, Mark Milligan, and, and Jesse Spencer, and many other uh, local doctors and nurses are also associated. Um, this here is the field hospital that uh, uh, Dr. Seal and I worked at. Um, it had facilities for uh, uh, ER uh, service, uh, inpatient units, and op a functional operating room. Uh, labor and delivery, malnutrition tent, a pharmacy, and an outpatient clinic. And this was uh, staffed by uh, visiting international physicians and nurses. In our group, we had uh, Dr. Seal, the OBGYN, uh, a nurse midwife, two pediatricians, and me to provide all these services for the people there. Um, it is currently transitioning to local leadership and medical personnel. Uh, the medical needs of the people of Leogan and, and of Haiti are, are gradually evolving. Since the initial trauma that was suffered in, at the time of the earthquake, there is now much more need for physical therapy, 
There continue to be infections, wound infections, cellulitis and whatnot. And then now we're seeing many more routine problems, such as abdominal pain, headache, upper respiratory infections, et cetera. One thing that I was impressed by was the great need for psychiatric and psychological treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder. We had many people who came to us with convulsions that, you know, that were atypical and seemed it was possible that they were pseudoseizures. Many, many people, if you ask them when their symptoms of their, you know, their headaches, their abdominal pain and whatnot, if you ask them when those symptoms started, they almost invariably said at the time of the earthquake. Just to give you an idea of some of the things that we treated while we were there this last week, we, on the inpatient unit, we had on average about eight patients there at a time. And on the outpatient basis, we saw approximately 50 patients per clinician. And we treated a variety of things. Dr. Seal and the nurse midwife were able to help with 12 vaginal deliveries. We had several neonatal resuscitations for babies that were having trouble breathing initially. On the outpatient basis, we treated a variety of things from malaria to malnutrition. This, just as a side note, I don't know if you can see that very well. This gentleman came in with an enormously swollen eye, and his story was that three days prior he had bumped his eye on something, and it was just enormous. And I had no idea whether that was an infection or if it was a hematoma or what. And so without the proper training and without specialist care there, we had to refer him to another hospital. We had many successes there. One example was an improvised oxygen tent for a newborn with respiratory distress. And there's Dr. Seal there, along with a pediatrician, frantically working to improvise this oxygen hood, essentially made out of a box and a piece of plexiglass. The reason that was necessary is that all we had for an oxygen source was a small condenser that wasn't very reliable. And so this is the only way that we could try to increase the oxygen supply to the infant. We also had a patient who underwent an above-knee amputation by the group just prior to ours, and she had a successful recovery and left the hospital in stable condition without infection. There was a baby there that was born at 32 weeks whose mother abandoned her, and the hospital was able to find an adoptive family for her. And we also helped to train many new nurses and doctors to help take over the medical care there. I think one of the most important contributions that we made while we were there is that we helped to improve relations with the Haitian people and let them know that we were aware of their struggles and that we cared about them. They continue to have ongoing challenges there. Very high on that list is poor access to specialized care. Dr. Seale and I and the other physicians there saw things that we highly suspected were breast cancers and ovarian cancers and cervical cancers and whatnot. And I have no idea if these patients will ever receive the care that they need because of the situation there. Patient transportation was a very big issue. Even though Leo Ghana is only 18 miles to Port-au-Prince, the highway between the two cities was damaged in the earthquake and is in very bad disrepair. This picture shows, I mean, this was taken on that thoroughfare. Plus, patients, excuse me, people did not travel at night there out of concern for safety. And so if we wanted to transport a patient from Leo Ghana to Port-au-Prince, we had to do so before 4 p.m., which made for some very nervous nights for us. And also medical supplies and equipment continue to be in short supply, including medications, oxygen, X-ray services, and ultrasound. 
the uh, the mission of that field hospital where we were working is only six months, and after that time, the uh, it'll be the responsibility of the local uh, medical personnel to provide medical care there. Um, the, as a result, they're uh, uh, quickly trying to rebuild the infrastructure. Uh, they're training doctors and nurses, and there's um, but there continues to be, and there there will be for some time now, or some time in the future, ongoing need of international support. Um, I, I wanted to uh, end by by sharing a story of this iconic picture from uh, following the earthquake. This is a picture of a young eight-year-old boy who was trapped for eight days along with his sister and their dead brother um, deep in the rubble. And um, when he was finally pulled out of the rubble, he, he spread his arms wide and had his huge grin on his face. And afterwards, he was asked why he did that. And he said, because I was finally free. And I think that that was one of the things that impacted me the most there was just that in the face of such devastation, these people still had hope. And uh, Paul Farmer is a physician and an outspoken advocate for Haiti. And he said, for me, an area of moral clarity is you're in front of someone who's suffering and you have the tools at your disposal to alleviate that suffering or even eradicate it, and you act. Thank you.